Hey everyone, this is your friendly neighborhood, Alvaro Cortez Jr. here, aka Lance Danger, starting up week three of the long road to hell. It's been a very emotional week last, it was a very emotional week last week, and things are kind of leveling out, they're feeling a little more normal. Um, I was able to get my um physical therapy scheduled for next week so next week i'm going to start with that journey in particular um this week i'm going to focus a lot on um hell beneath you again um i kind of sidetracked a little bit last week as i uh, spoke and while i was like taking notes and kind of arranging how i'm going to do things uh, i dabbled in doing other stuff like Warlord and Funny Bone and whatnot, and I'm just going to give a lot more focus on Hell Beneath You as well, since this is the point of this um, video series that I'm doing as well. Um, I am going to keep talking about my other projects as well, of course, but Hell Beneath You is the main course so to speak of these videos so hopefully you'll be able to enjoy uh, more of the process more of the behind the scenes uh once again if you hear the bells or just pitter pattering around those are the cats um who have really really acclimated to the new environment very very well um as most of you saw last week with fiona um already claiming the desk where I work as well. She's pretty much claimed everything in the apartment, actually, to be honest. Um, Puchito is very chill, the other cat. So as long as he has somewhere to sleep and eat, he's happy. Like, he's a very simple cat that way. Um, oddly enough, um, they both are pretty at attached to me. Uh, but Puchito, the male cat, he's actually a little bit more attached to me than uh, the other cat, Fiona. Even though Fiona is the one that'll jump on the laptop, will jump on my lap desk. Um, she's the one that will jump on you in the middle of the night, go up to your chest and, you know, cuddle up to go to sleep. Um, Puchito isn't as cuddly. But he does follow you around. Like, he follows me around the most out of the two cats, as I mentioned before, that he was kind of starting to following me or follow me around a bit. Um, like, he pretty much follows me all over, all over the place uh, compared to the other cat. Like, she's more independent, I guess, and she's more attached to my girlfriend also. So there's that as well. Um, the other cat wasn't ever as attached to my girlfriend. She was more attached to my girlfriend's mother. So, at least that's what um, she says. I, I, <laughs> who am I to not believe her? And, you know, he's kind of grown very attached to me. And even though he's not as cuddly and he'll jump on me like every once in a while... Um, he seems to just settle with knowing where I am, you know, like if I'm in the living room, he'll just like snuggle up to inside a box that we have here and he'll just like kind of look over to see, see if I'm there and he'll just like tuck in. If I go to the kitchen, he'll go casually into the kitchen as well. He'll eat a little bit and as soon as I leave the kitchen... Uh, he'll leave too when I'm in the bedroom. Like, he'll appear also when I'm in the restroom. Uh, he's at the door when I open it. Sometimes they both are, actually. But yeah, like, he's the type of cat that will just settle for knowing that you're around as compared to the other cat who's very cuddly and very affectionate in that sense. Not that the other cat isn't affectionate. He'll definitely... Uh, headbutt you and rub up to you every now and then but it isn't like a constant thing like with the other cat it's all good to me i love cats anyway so um cats dogs animals they all tend to have such unique personalities especially cats 
in my personal opinion and in my own personal experience, exhibit much more individual, individual, oh, individualist. Um, I can't talk right now. Um, the more they just they develop their individuality, individuality more than other species. I promise I can talk. It's just when the camera is on, I kind of blew. But anyway, um, as I was saying, I am going to concentrate more on Hell Beneath You, on the stuff that I'm going to be showing. And of course, here is my trusty notebook where I'm going, where I've been writing all my notes and doing small sketches for promotional artwork, character design, um, plot points and whatnot. And, you know, hopefully I'll be able to show more progress on the project itself. Um, as I mentioned before, I will be showing more progress on other projects as well, since I am involved in a lot of them. Um, Halloween is coming up, my favorite time of the year. The fall is my favorite station of the year. So yeah, I, I'm pumped. Things are um, kind of falling into place right now. Uh, and um, next week I'm going to start physical therapy and hopefully that'll help avoid surgery on this bicep. So uh, taking it one day at a time. I uploaded this piece a little later than I originally wanted to. Um, I have fallen way behind. I find behind like a week now for the Indietober Inktober challenge. Um, my shoulders have been feeling worse lately. Um, I'm still hoping that just when I start physical therapy, hopefully my shoulders will start getting back to normal. Uh, right now, my problem is that they feel very weak. Um, usually throughout the day, they're pretty sore and I can't really reach like I normally reach. Um, but lately, it's been getting worse in the sense that when I go to sleep and once I wake up, my shoulder, especially my left shoulder for some reason, feels extremely weak to the point where it feels like I can't even move my arm because it's so weak and so sore. And sometimes the cats, when we're sleeping, um, I don't know if it's that they sense that my shoulders are hurting or something. And uh, especially Fiona, she'll jump on my shoulder and she'll just rest there and look at me. And part of me is thinking that she's probably just worried about me because cats are pretty intuitive like that. Well, animals in general um, are pretty intuitive like that, especially dogs as well. So, and lately when I work on stuff, she'll jump on the, she'll jump on me or call my attention. Like if I'm doing, if I'm sitting down for like too long, so I would like to think that it's just her way of like saying, hey, I have my eye on you. Don't overstress yourself, especially because you have to take care of me and give me lots of pets. <laughs> that, that's the impression that I get anyway. So I uh, I uploaded this way later than I wanted to. I've been very slow trying to do stuff, especially creatively. Uh, it has been frustrating. I, I'm not going to lie. It has been frustrating, especially since I started off with quite a bit of momentum. I guess it was probably the adrenaline of the moment kind of helped push me forward to do these illustrations. And now, like, the reality or, like, the physicality of it is kind of setting in. So... Yeah, here's the boy, number five again, from Umbrella Academy. Outstanding, outstanding comic. Um, hopefully, I'll be able to, even if I take longer than I originally wanted to, uh, hopefully, I'll just be able to produce these illustrations. So, I thought I'd just give a small 
change of scenery, so I'm just in the kitchen as I try to get a midnight snack. Um, I My schedule is like a late schedule, so I'm always doing things at night. I am a night owl, and sometimes I feel a little more comfortable um, doing stuff in the kitchen. Oh. Mob Psycho 100. I don't know who's watched that anime or read the manga. One of our favorite animes here in the apartment. So anyway, um, one of the classes for Scott Snyder, as I mentioned before, I have been taking the Substack classes. And one of the comics that he recommended to read was Tom King's Division and also Grant Morrison's All-Star Superman. Uh, All-Star Superman I had already read a long while ago, actually a few years ago. Um, I, I didn't read it when it first came out. Um, a friend of mine actually lent the trade to me a couple of years ago, and I finally read it, and I really enjoyed it, actually. Uh, Grant Morrison has always been one of those writers that kind of gets Superman to me. Um, he gets a lot of superhero characters very well. Uh, certainly one of the best ever to write superhero comics. Um, his Justice League America, JLA, uh, run in the 90s is outstanding. One of my all-time favorite uh, comic book series, along with um, artist Howard Porter, who is one of my all-time favorite artists who had just come off the ray, which, of course, you know, is one of my all-time favorite characters and so on and so forth. Christopher Priest, the writer of the ray, the main ongoing series editor on the miniseries that got me into wanting to make comics so it's kind of like a whole degree kind of thing there so yeah i thoroughly enjoyed superman um all-star superman and i had not read the vision before um i was always curious about it um i am aware of tom king's work i did collect his run on batman uh it was okay i enjoyed it well enough um, I'm still surprised that so many people were mad that Batman and Catwoman didn't get married because it's like, come on, it's it's comics. And if you've read, if you kind of pick up on his style, you know it's not going to be a happy ending for that issue. But I digress. I have, um, I've read his Batman run. I also uh, read and bought uh, Heroes in Crisis. Um, Heroes in Crisis was a peculiar one. Uh, I'm a huge Wally West fan. The Mark Wade Wally West Flash was one of those comics that also made me want to make comics. So I think I'll kind of reserve what I what I think about the comic because this isn't a review show. Um, all I can say is that it was an interesting concept. I think more could have been done with it. In a way, I don't know. It, it, it was an interesting one for sure, I guess. Um, if you enjoyed it, like, I'm very happy for you. Not to say that I didn't enjoy it, but again, I'm a big Wally West fan. So, again, I'll reserve my judgment on, you know, what I think about the comic and whatnot. You know, this isn't a review show, so... Yeah, so I am aware of Tom King's work, and I read The Visions and The Vision, and I really liked it. I, I it's really really a great story. I, I really enjoyed it. It's probably the thing that I have liked the most that Tom King has written that I've read so far. Uh, I've read a little bit of Mister Miracle. I was buying it in the beginning, but I kind of yes stop reading it i was more interested to be on to be honest in doomsday clock which was kind of coming out at the same time but unfortunately of course there was a lot of delays for doomsday clock and it ended way later way later than it should have so and um also the adam strange comic um i got the first issue but i really haven't followed up on it. Um, I probably will get the trades eventually, at least for Mr. Miracle. 
because I did like the whole dark side is thing, you know, to each their own. But The Visions was an incredible story to me. It really was. I really enjoyed it. It's probably like right up there in like comics that I've read in the past few years. I was really, really amazed at how good it was. And, and, you know, like, the art was fantastic. The artist's name escapes my my mind right now. I really feel terrible about that. But it's almost the witching hour. I've been working on stuff. I'm reading. So you have to forgive me on that one. And, again, it's interesting to read about, read these comics and kind of finding, like, the voice and style of a writer and actually, if, if when I when I look at it, Tom King and I have very similar um, voices in that sense, dealing with like a lot of characters with trauma, moving on, and stuff like that, tragedies. Um, not exactly the typical happy ending on stuff. You know, like there are actually many similarities between um, our writing styles. Not to say that I'm on the level of a Tom King. Um, I certainly don't think I am, even though I do think I am a relatively solid writer. Um, it's kind of like those, like that Bruce Lee quote. I can't say that I'm not talented because I'd be lying, but I can't say that I'm, I'm talented because then it's gloating. So it's like, I'm perfectly mediocre, <laughs> I guess. Like, or at least good enough to have a audience that reads my stuff and that's afforded me to get other freelance writing stuff as well. So I'm very fortunate and grateful for that. And um, I guess I do have a recognizable voice in that sense as well, because like a lot of times I'm the person that gets called on for freelance writing, like to tell origin stories or the more emotional stories or like the breather stories, uh, breather stories reading, being kind of like the story that lets the environment and the characters kind of breathe a little bit after like a very action-packed, non-stop, high-intensity kind of storyline, you know, kind of like the for example, Chris Claremont writing the X-Men playing baseball or basketball or just chilling in a pub or something like that. You know, like those little small stories that kind of develop the characters a little more and just gives the space to breathe a little bit for the reader as well to kind of like come down from that like high stakes kind of stories. So I guess that's pretty much my voice, at least from what I could tell from what people have told me. And it's been interesting kind of like thinking to myself, what exactly is my voice in, um, in my writing style? So definitely the vision gave me a lot to think about in that sense. Uh, hopefully I'll be able to grow even more from this and also, you know, put a lot more effort into putting a good distinctive voice in uh, hell beneath you. Uh, I really do want it to be one of the best things, if not the best thing I've ever written. So that's definitely one of my main goals for that. And hopefully I'll find, um, keep discovering myself along the way as well. Hey everyone. Um, if you see me with the headphones on, I'm actually connected to my tablet and also to my laptop as well. Um, I've been recording the return of my podcast, the Serene Chaos Podcast. So it's been a long night. I recorded two episodes in one night. Um, my goal for the Serene Chaos Podcast, contrary to the original first season I did of the first of uh, those three episodes. Um, my intention was to do it weekly, but at the time I was juggling a lot of things at the same time. So I really wasn't able to accomplish that. Um, I only did like two episodes in a row and maybe it took like 
quite a few months, maybe even a year in between episode two and episode three. So I'm taking a different approach approach to this since they aren't live streams. What I'm doing is that I'm just batch recording them just so that I can be able to get afford myself time to be able to edit it at my own pace, uh, release it in a consistent schedule. Since I am doing a lot of things again, or at least trying to, um, within um, within the space that I can do it with my injuries and whatnot and my recoveries. So uh, I am going to do it bi-weekly. So that's going to definitely buy me time in recording and editing and uploading. Uh, the great thing is that compared to when I first started podcasting, um, you had to like jump through a lot of hoops to put it in a place like um, Apple Podcasts, for example, back then. You had to go through a whole process uh, on the approval as well. Uh, now podcasts are so common and popular that the great thing is that through the same service of Podomatic, which is what I was using before, I can just submit to not only Apple Podcasts, but to Spotify, Google Podcasts, um, Radio FM, um, just a, a whole lot of places that uh, you can send your podcast to. And it's amazing if you think about it, you know, how even less than 10 years, the landscape has changed so much. Like, you can't stop, you know, technology, I guess. Um, it's like the more you're born in this era, the more privilege privileges, I still can't talk. Uh, the more privileges um, you're afforded in terms of technology. Like, I would have died to have this kind of technology when I was a teenager or when I was in my 20s. I guess that also makes me more appreciative of having these opportunities now uh, as opposed to not having it back then because I'm also a lot wiser than I was in my teenage years and in my 20s, so... You know that'll that counts for something. I hope so. Yeah, if my if voice is a little coarse, if I seem a little bit out of it, it's because I've been out it for like maybe three hours now, almost in a row, uh, in between recording and editing and preparing and formatting and exporting and just having everything ready so it can be a smooth upload when I upload into the different um, categories. So yeah, fun times. So going back to uh, Hell Beneath You and the uh, uh, Scott Snyder classes, uh, one of the things that um, he put as an assignment was to kind of find that difference between yourself as a writer and yourself as a person, uh, which was a very interesting assignment, you know, and kind of like checking yourself to see how much of yourself you're actually putting into the story that you're writing and to the characters that you're developing. And it's a very interesting thing, especially because a lot of people nowadays will say that, you know, for example, a lot of writers and creators are kind of self-inserting themselves into characters in comics and whatnot. And... I learned a long time ago from, I believe it was from the Chris Oatley podcast, um, way back when. Um, he did talk about this as well about, um, characters when you're kind of basing them off yourself in a way that if you're going to do a self insertion of a character, um, that if you're going to put all their, all your strong points into a character, it's very important to put your flaws as well, just to have that balance and a more well-rounded and a more, you know, more approachable. Well, approachable is not the word, but more relatable character to the reader as well. 
And I just find that fascinating. It's always fascinated me, to be honest. Like, I think I've mentioned it before in other vlogs and the, the hundreds videos or something, the 100 days of making comics, that people in the beginning used to really think that uh, Fred Peterson, the Mighty Warlord, for example, um, Fred Peterson himself was like a self-insert, and that's far from the truth, to be honest. Um, yeah, there are some character traits that I put of myself into Fred, but they're extremely exaggerated, to be honest, to the point where it's not really myself. If anything, I'm a little bit more like the his one of his close friends, John Gardner, also known as Rising Star, um, which, of course, I exaggerated a lot of his features as well. But I think I put a little more of myself into him in the terms of like the self-doubt of being like in these positions of leaderships and at the same time just doubting myself and whatnot um i have spoken before i believe that um i used to go to church when i was younger and sometimes i would just have these opportunities land on me because everyone else would kind of pass up on it and you know i would be like um, within the other uh, youths in the church, you know, I would end up being like the group leader of the youth division in the church. I would be like the leader of, in charge of uh, like a daycare kind of program they had on the weekends, on Saturdays, uh, where children could come into the church and kind of have like a safe place to just play and have fun and whatnot. And I would keep getting these responsibilities that I didn't ask for. They would just land on me. And for one reason or another, I didn't say no, for better or worse, you know. And although I think I did grow a lot as a person doing that, um, there was a lot of insecurities that came with that, especially afterwards when I left the church. Um, that's probably a story. That's really a story for another day. Maybe if you're all curious or if it's like directly related to yes now, like if it's directly related to a topic, then I'll probably talk a little bit more about it. But yeah, you know, it is interesting that dynamic of putting yourself into the character, sometimes quite literally. Um, I haven't really done that yet. The only time I have done that has been for the... Um, comic strip Nevermind, which is, of course, autobiographical, so I kind of have no choice there, you know? And, and even so, sometimes I kind of downplay things a little bit or give a certain tone of exaggeration, you, you know, just enough to make it interesting for anyone that's reading it. Are there any other creators out there or any other writers out there that do just that, like, kind of Think about the whole, how much of yourself you're putting into a character, um, how much is too much, how little is too little, um, how much until it becomes like, as they, that, that word has been around lately, self-insertion. Uh, it's always been a topic that's interesting to me. And if anyone out there wants to like mention that in the comments or shoot me a private message, like that would be awesome, actually. So as you can see, I have my handy notes here. Um, here are like some of the notes that the stuff that I've been talking about previously and this week. Um, just like writing down like the comics that I was going to read or that I read. Um, thinking about the whole writer and yourself as a person, um, uh, which I spoke about last time also to an extent. Um, even though it veered off more into, uh, uh, self insert insertion and whatnot. Um, to like kind of clarify a bit more on the writer and yourself as a person, uh, kind of what I discover is that as a writer, I write about a lot of bad things, but there's always kind of like that sense of optimism hanging around that things might turn out okay. And it usually has a relatively happy resolution. And I, I was just thinking about that because sometimes people tell me that even though I have gone through a lot of things or when I'm currently going through a lot of things, 
I almost look unfazed in the ways that I always try to stay upbeat. And um, uh, one friend, she would describe me as always staying chipper, you know, which is, I guess, a great um, way to describe it, I guess. You know, and that's kind of like how I am as a person. And that's kind of what I reflect in my writing as well. And another assignment from the Scott Snyder classes, uh, which um, is mostly about characterizations and um, how each title kind of caters to a different kind of character, a different set of motivations and whatnot. And it's interesting to kind of break down all these things that I've written and that I've never really given much thought about. Like, for example, um, Fred Peterson, The Mighty Warlord, which was kind of an example I was talking about in the previous segment in yesterday's um, recording of, of this thing. Um, one of the things about the characters is that people really grow attached to them. They really go close to these characters but they're, because they're so relatable, relatable to an extent and they get so close and attached to them that they don't want anything bad to happen to them. And when bad things do happen, people have a very big reaction to it. So that's kind of like the tone and characterization of that title. Uh, with Nevermind, I myself am kind of like a window to the, those stories. So people will read the story and be like, oh, I can't believe it. It's like, you know, kind of like more watching like a show or something like that compared to like Warlord, which is, you know, tradi somewhat traditional superhero kind of storytelling and a different set of motivation for the characters as where, where Warlord, for example, like I said, people will grow attached to them and they don't want anything bad to happen. Um, with Nevermind, it's like that curiosity of the things that are, happen to me or rather the character in the strip is so random that they just kind of want to see what else is going to happen because I'm kind of like that link between the story and the reader. So that's a very interesting difference there. Of course, with The Mysterious Exorcist, it's kind of an examination of how I think, I guess, some people can be cruel and cold in this world. And, you know, even though I like to believe there is good in every person. I also have the awareness that some people are just bad people, you know, and sometimes you don't really get to know the story of why they become the way they were. And sometimes there isn't even a story, you know, the human brain, the human personality, it's just so undefinable sometimes. And that's kind of creepy that, um, the person that you least expect could blow up in a way that you never would expect them to. And I think that's something that, especially in the first Exorcist uh, one-shot story that I, that I wrote, Good, uh, Good Night San Juan, um, I don't want to give too much away if you haven't read it, but the person that you probably least expected was the culprit in all these heinous things that were happening in this story. And also, again, Funny Bone and Clown as well as as an extension, since they're both so related to each other. Um, it's mostly about people that have lost other people and how they react to it. And areas, some you know how some people they'll lose um, someone close and. They'll just, they'll mourn and they'll move on, but other people sometimes they just can't move on, and that's pretty much funny bone and clown. They can't really move on from losing the people that were important in their lives and how that affects their own lives and the lives of the people around them. So it's essentially loss, as you know, that sense of loss and how it affects them and their environment. Whereas Delta Task Force 6 um, is about how trauma, especially kind of like childhood trauma, um, kind of guides you the rest of your life in a sense um, when you're in that situation. Sometimes, again, it's like 
you can't control it. Like, it's more like it controls you in a way, especially if you don't seek out help eventually. And that's, like, one of the main character's problems. Again, not to get too much into spoilers if you haven't read it. Um, I've only done one chapter of Delta Task Force 6 and um, just started chapter 2 when I got COVID. Um, it's really a, um, as I've always described it, it is a psychological horror thriller science fiction. So I always kind of do a hodgepodge of genres for some reason. And Wepa Mani Wepito, for those that's read it in Spanish, um, it is, uh, you know, satire, but it's almost in a way of like things that happen that are so bad or so ridiculous that you kind of can't help but laugh. You kind of laugh not to cry in a sense, you know, and that's kind of like the whole cynicism and sarcasm behind that um, strip that you know, it's messed up what's happening, but hey, let's have a good laugh out of it. Uh, the canon girl, of course, is kind of like a character that loves herself, is in that void of loving herself and also kind of teaching other people to love themselves as well because there should be no bigger love than the love that you have for yourself because, you know, it is the golden rule in a sense, you know, whether it be in religion or in even psychiatry, um, if you don't love yourself, you really can't fully love someone else. You know, so you have to kind of have that self-awareness and um, being able to have that love for yourself. And it's not being selfish or narcissistic. It's knowing your worth and paying it forward also in a way. And of course, Hell Beneath You, uh, kind of similar to Funny Bone and Clown. Uh, one of the main themes is moving on, but also it's family. Um, it's about family and how they deal with a tragedy. Um, it's kind of like a mix between Warlord and Funny Bone that I really would want the people, the readers, to kind of relate and get attached to these characters. And hopefully that'll catch make them read more and want to read more about them um hell beneath you is re this this whole trajectory of the classes and recording it i've really learned a lot about myself as a creator and to an extent as a person too so uh hopefully any of you that's been watching, you'll be able to learn a little bit of yourself as well and grow as creators or as per as a person or, you know, whatever that you want to aspire to be. Which I've done this week. Um, my shoulder has been having problems this week. It's starting to get a little bit better. Um, hopefully this Monday, once physical therapy starts, I'll be able to be able to draw more consistently. Um, this is one of the promotional ideas that I showed the thumbnails to, I think last week or maybe in the first episode. I don't. Remember, like, time is a concept that I can't quite grasp right now. Um, curse of being a night owl, I guess. And um, there you go. That's going to be essentially the mayor of King's Kill, New York. Um, he's here pretty much like a promotional kind of welcome to the town kind of thing. Welcome to tranquility. So... Like, the thing about the town is that it's so tranquil, it's so peaceful, it's kind of like a slice of heaven on earth kind of thing, you know, so that's pretty much what our main characters really want, just to have, like, escape the madness that was the life that they had before um, that tragedy struck them. And they kind of want that slower pace. So they happen to um, move to this area called King's Kill, New York. Kind of, yes, to get away from everything and kind of 
rebuild and heal and start all over as a family and whatnot. So, again, this is pretty much the mayor. As you can see in the sketch, he's pretty happy there. He's a very happy-go-lucky kind of character. Maybe a little too happy-go-lucky. But I digress. I had a lot of fun kind of fleshing out this sketch a little more. Kind of give that uh, character a little more, well, character, for lack of a better word. Yeah, freelance writer here. So, yeah, um, this was a lot of fun. Hopefully, I'll be able to flesh it out a little more. Um, I'm trying to do little things here and there. I'm also I'm considering trying to maybe see how I can do things left-handed as well, even though my left shoulder right now is the one that's ex affecting me the most. Um, you know, worst-case scenario, I want to be prepared, so... I am really giving a lot of thought into um, doing more things left-handed. I do believe I spoke about um, being ambidextrous and whatnot, I believe, in last week's episode. So there's always that option there, I guess, that I can explore as well. So yeah, this is uh, the sketch that I was fleshing out. Um, I'm going to work a little more. Uh, I don't know if I'm going to have that much time. I do have a lot of other stuff to do as well. A lot of uh, personal stuff. But yeah, at the very least, I'm starting to kind of get into the sketching a little bit again. So, I've been also doing a lot of work on my Patreon lately. Um, I have uploaded another, I haven't done in a while actually, um, another behind the scenes, never mind, uh, one of the free blogs that I do over at Patreon that is open to the public that anyone can read. Um, I uploaded one yesterday, I believe it was. <laughs> Again, like, uh, time is a very weird concept for me right now, especially since. I am doing a lot of things again that I had to postpone and that I'm slowly working on again. And as I mentioned before, I am doing my podcast again. So what I'm thinking is that I'm going to upload the podcast as a Patreon first um, thing. You know, like people that are on my Patreon that are contributing with as little as one dollar, um, you can listen to the podcast way in advance compared to when I upload it to like Podomatic and YouTube and all the other podcast places that I'm planning to upload it to. Um, I was thinking about doing the same with this video series as well, but unfortunately, Patreon doesn't really have a video a video feature. Uh, they do have an audio feature that you can upload audio files and whatnot, but you can't upload video files. And I guess it makes sense in a way. Uh, I kind of wish they did, but the only other way would be doing it as like an unlisted or private YouTube video and then putting that link into Patreon. That's one way to do it, but I don't know. I kind of just prefer to just post it when it's done then and upload it rather, you know. So, you know, that's that's one thing that I'm going to do with the podcast. I really want to also put a lot of content on Patreon. My Patreon has really been lacking. And again, it's ever since COVID, everything just fell off the way, wayside. Um, I had exclusive web comics that I was going to do on Patreon as well. Um, and again, like, I'm slowly building that up again. Uh, I've been slowly kind of doing, like, the uh, Fred Peterson covered where I talk about the motivations and whatnot of covers that I did for Warlord. Um, I'm going to continue doing that and doing it for my other web comics and comics as well. And um, those are for free. Like uh, the ninety percent of my content is free on Patreon. Uh, truth be told, like 
the things that you can get for as low as one dollar are like um high resolution images that you can print out of pinups of warlord that i posted there um you can also download pdfs of the comics that i have available at indie planet like um the original four issues of warlord which is the prologue webisodes issue one and two um they're also available for download uh in at uh, my patreon as well as nevermind and stupid the cat for example and right now funny bone rage of the lucky um 13 um i am working on it i am working on new covers i am editing the script so i can upload that there as well uh chapters one and two are already there um, so hopefully in a few weeks, chapter three will go up and next month, chapter four will go up as well. So I'm really trying to reinvent my Patreon and kind of reinvent my social media because I also noticed that on Facebook, I was missing a lot of art stuff, especially concerning Funny Bone and, um, you know, and in terms of the short stories and the promotional work and whatnot. And I really have to be on top of that. I have to be on the ball with that more. So that's definitely one of my goals moving forward as well. So another week has come by and gone. Uh, it was a um, not as productive as I wish it could have been. Uh, because again, my shoulders are not cooperating and whatnot. But as I said, um, tomorrow I start physical therapy. So hopefully that will help. Um, a lot of it has to do with my range. Uh, I don't have much range with my shoulders. I don't have much strength in my shoulders. And I don't have like... Um, I don't even know the word, like the stamina to like be long hours on my laptop doing stuff. Like I've really been pushing myself hard. Um, I'm actually editing. I don't know if you can see well, but I am editing um, the second episode of Road to Hell. Uh, I just kind of like piece it all together throughout the week. And then at the end of the week, I'll just kind of put it all together and edit it and whatnot. So that's pretty much what my ritual has been in that sense. Um, I think I've been comfortable doing it so far that way. So uh, hopefully I'll be able to maintain that consistency moving forward with um, these types of videos. So... It was kind of frustrating that I wasn't able to at least draw as much, but at the same time, I did find out a lot of things about myself as a person and as a writer as well with uh, these exercises from Scott Snyder's writing class and actually trying to focus on, you know, what it is that I do as a writer and how that reflects as a person and all that jazz that I was talking about earlier and the other segments of the video. So it has been very educational for me in that sense. So uh, hopefully I'll just keep growing from this. And as I said, Hell Beneath You is the comic that I want to be like one of the crown jewels of what I've written. So hopefully a lot of that will be reflected in what I do. Like a lot of um, people will hopefully have fun reading it and are engrossed by the story, are entertained by it. Um, that's completely out of my hand how people are going to react to it, of course. But I'm going to do the best possible to be able to do a product that people will enjoy. Anyway, that wraps week number three. Uh, it's been exhausting physically and emotionally, but things are starting to look up, so... Thank you all for watching week three. It wasn't as perfect as I didn't want it, as I wish it could be, but it's not about being perfect. It's about finishing and developing that habit. So in that sense, week three, flawless victory. Catch you all next time.